In the last two decades, HP's search interest has plummeted faster than a skydiver with a faulty parachute, dropping by more than 60%. And it's not hard to see why. They've been named in numerous lawsuits for unpaid bills and bribery. It's like they've taken business lessons from a mob boss. They were once the pioneers of Silicon Valley, creating innovative technology and leading the world in computing. But what happened to Hewlett Packard? How did this once great company fall from grace and lose its way? In a desperate attempt to escape its sinking ship, HP tried to diversify outside of its core business and break into the enterprise software market. But instead of making waves, they just made a massive fool of themselves. They overpaid for acquisition so badly that they had to write off a whopping $8.8 billion. That's more money than most of us can even fathom. And if that wasn't enough for a disaster, HP then had to scramble to survive. They split themselves into two separate companies, a personal computer company and a printer industry, like a magician trying to escape from a straitjacket. But it was all for nothing because their narrow focus just made things worse. Layoffs became the name of the game at HP, and they swung that axe with reckless abandon. They cut jobs in every direction, leaving a trail of unemployed workers in the wake. At the turn of the millennium, HP employed a whopping 350,000 people. But by 2021, the number had plummeted to a mere 50,000 in the parent company and 60,000 in the spinoff. That's almost a million people who lost their job because of HP's epic failures. You might think that firing thousands of employees would help HP's financial situation, but you'd be dead wrong. In fact, they've only gotten weaker and weaker, like a wet noodle in a hurricane. The odds of HP Inc. filing for bankruptcy are currently at a whopping 38%, while HP Enterprise isn't far behind at 44%. To put it in perspective, the chances of Apple going bankrupt are about as likely as a unicorn winning the lottery. But it wasn't always like this for HP. Back in the day, they were the cool kids on the block, the OGs of Silicon Valley. They were founded by a guy named William Reddington Hewlett, or Bill Hewlett for short, over a century ago. Bill was born just before World War I, and thanks to his dad's cushy job at the University of Michigan, he didn't have to worry about the war too much. In fact, his family even moved to what would become Silicon Valley because of a job promotion. Talk about good timing. Bill wasn't just a pretty face, though. He was highly educated, unlike some of Silicon Valley founders we see today. He got his bachelor's degree in engineering from Stanford and went on to get a master's degree from MIT. But he wasn't done there. No, no. He went back to Stanford to get another master's degree in electrical engineering. This guy was a gluten for punishment. But even with all of this education, Bill couldn't have predicted what was going to happen to HP. They went from being the founders of Silicon Valley to being drained dry by the very business they had influenced. It's like watching your kid grow up to be a deadbeat. Sad, really. Bill and David were college buddies who loved electronics, and it was clear they were going to be lifelong pals. But David's first love wasn't electronics. He preferred throwing around basketballs and pigskins. So after college, he took a job at General Electric in New York, which was probably the safest move he could make after dodging tackles on the football field. However, David didn't stay at GE for long. He decided to go back to Stanford to get his master's degree in electrical engineering, which was definitely the geekiest decision he could have made. Bill, on the other hand, was already knee-deep in engineering, having graduated with a bachelor's degree from Stanford and a master's degree from MIT. He was so smart that he probably had a PhD in being brilliant. So, with their combined expertise and a total of $538 in their pockets, Bill and David began tinkering with electronics projects in a rented space. They created all sorts of wacky devices like audio signal generators, distortion analyzers, and frequency oscillators. But... Then they realized they needed to make some real money. So they focused on creating something that people would actually buy. Their big break came when they figured out how to stabilize audio oscillators by adding an incandescent light bulb. And just like that, HP was born, but not without some drama. If David had won the coin toss, their business would have been called PH, which would have been a terrible idea because who wants to be reminded of their high school chemistry class nightmares? Fortunately, Bill won the coin toss and HP went to sell their 200 oscillator for a mere $39.40. It was a game changer, outperforming the competition in stability and price. Even the Walt Disney Studios head sound engineer was impressed and ordered eight of them. And so Bill and David went from being college buddies to business partners, making a name for themselves in the electronics world. It just goes to show you that two brainiacs with a little bit of money and a lot of talent can achieve great things. Or maybe they were just lucky. Who knows? HP started off with a bang, generating a whopping $5,369 in revenue and $1,550.63 in profit. 
That's like making it rain with today's equivalent of $115,000 and $2,000 profit. And just like that, HP was in business. Fast forward to the end of World War II and HP was making a bank by producing military equipment like cultivator technology and artillery shell proximity fuses. But it wasn't until the Traders 8 left Professor William Shockley's side that HP really started to take off. These eight graduates started their own semiconductor business, which ultimately birthed both Intel and AMD. HP wanted in on the action, but their outsourcing to Japan was a major oopsie-daisy that cost them more money than they saved. Finally, in 1966, HP entered the computing industry with the HP 2100 slash HP 1000. But here's the kicker. They didn't want to expand into the personal computer market. No, not going to do it. And when Steve Wozniak offered them a PC idea five times, they rejected him every time. Talk about a missed opportunity. But don't worry. They eventually entered the PC market in 1988 with the HP 85. They were ready to take on IBM. But let's just say it was a bit of a late start. HP always making moves, even if they're not always the right ones. Better late than never, I suppose. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times for HP. They were printing money, quite literally, with their selection of inkjet and laser printers, as well as scanners. This was the HP we know and love today. But back then, they were more dominant than King Kong on steroids. In fact, they were so successful that they registered their ninth domain, HP.com which was bigger deal than a discovery of the Holy Grail. And if that wasn't enough, the group that launched HP was recognized as a historical landmark, making them even cooler than Indiana Jones. But alas, the 90s arrived and things started to go south for HP. The demise of the company was not due to one single factor, but rather the death by a thousand paper cuts. It all started with the commoditization of PCs. Gone were the days when the brand of your computer mattered more than the size of your bank account. People were willing to buy any computer from any company as long as it was cheap. So while Dell went on to focus on cloud computing like wise old sage, HP decided to compete in the increasingly crowded PC market. And boy did they try. But as they say, trying is the first step towards failure. Their profit margins were so low that they made Scrooge McDuck look like a philanthropist. Even Pacer, the no-name brand, was giving them a run for their money. Dell may have faced a similar dilemma, but they handled it like a boss. Michael Dell came out of retirement and made the business public. They did a Microsoft and shifted to providing infrastructure solutions and cloud computing, which are the industries that are currently booming. Their consumer's business now serves more to build brand recognition than to generate revenue. HP, on the other hand, was still trying to compete in the PC and printer markets year after year. Like a marathon runner with a broken leg, HP's attempt to enter the cloud market was a massive flop, so bad that big organizations wouldn't even give them the time of day. And it's no surprise, really. I mean, have you ever seen their touchpad? They introduced it in 2001, and it was such a disaster that they stopped making it in less than two months. That's like breaking it with someone before the first date. Ouch. But HP didn't stop there. Oh, no. They thought, hey, let's try the smartphone industry. What could go wrong, right? Well, let me tell you, it didn't go well. In fact, their acquisition of Economy Corporation was probably their biggest mistake. They invested over $10 billion into the business, but it turned out to be a total disaster. The eight HP brands they acquired only served to undermine autonomy. It's like bringing eight cooks into a tiny kitchen and expect them to work together without any arguments. Spoiler alert, it never ends well. So what did HP do next? They tried to pivot, but it's like putting a Band-Aid on a bullet wound. They had already missed the boat, and the American tech sector had shifted away from hardware. Google sells its hardware at a loss or for no profit for a reason. The real money is in software. Even Apple knows this, which is why they've been pushing their surfaces so much. But HP? They've been beating a dead horse for decades, and things have only gotten worse for them. They had to lay off employees left and right, and it's not looking good for the future. Unless they have a real revolution, they are screwed. It's like watching a slow-motion train wreck. It's not pretty, but you can't look away. And that, my friends, is the dramatic and hilarious story of how HP lost all its significance. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications. Don't miss out on our upcoming videos, and we'll see you in the next one.